This video is sponsored by Exter. Picture this, it's 1994, you're Tim Burton, you've just made the two greatest comic book movies anyone had seen up until that point. You're essentially the godfather of Batman movies. You get back into the boardroom with Warner Brothers to pitch Batman 3. You're so excited, you've got brilliant ideas and are firing off your vision, only to be met with blank stares every time you hit a point that should have them gripping their seats in excitement. You sigh, say, you don't want me to do the third Batman, do you? and walk out. Your connection to the series and the characters severed forever. And it's understandable, of course. I mean, you know, Batman Returns was dark, it was brooding, it was almost nihilistic, and of course, you know, they weren't able to sell their happy toys, so are you fucking kidding me, Warner Brothers? Why didn't you do more of this? Where was the Batman 3? Where was the Tim Burton Batman 3? Ah, uh, okay. Let's get back to reality here. Let me calm myself. Okay, slow down. Before we hop in the Batmobile, we're gonna need some protection. Sadly, we don't have a fully armored bat suit for this, but our friends at Exter have provided that level of defense to your wallet. Are you tired of the bulky, pleather, unsecured paperweight that you keep your back credit card in? Never leave the cave without it. Do you worry about not having the tools you need to fight RFID thieves? With Exter's ultra compact wallets made of premium metals, not only can you keep your card secure, you can do so while taking up far less space in your pockets. With the Exter Wallet's simple mechanism, you can fan out and access your cards with one click, and then resecure them afterwards just as easily. It's pretty much like a glorified Batman gadget. Whether I'm traveling or just going out on the town or fighting crime with Robin, everything has become faster, easier, and safer. The best part is Exter Wallets come with a tracker that can be rung by your phone or vice versa, allowing you to recover either one worldwide should you accidentally leave it behind. So what are you waiting for? Check out the link in the description below for an extra 5% off your extra purchase on top of the 25% Christmas sale and 35% off orders over $200 that is already going on. And give that back credit card of yours the protection it deserves. And thank you so much to Exter for sponsoring this video. Batman Returns is, how do I say this? Amazing. I bet you thought I was about to call it the best Batman movie ever made, did you? But I can't betray my boy Chris that way. But goddamn, is it arguably the most underrated and underappreciated film in the Batman filmography, especially when you look at how it expanded the character, Burton's influence on him, and the way we view his infamous rogues gallery. And look, I have all the love in the world for Batman 89. Burton inaugurated a world with that first movie. It redefined what the big screen Batman could be. Had an aesthetic influence on the character that went beyond cinema and into the comics and animated series, and is a genuinely masterful film in its own right. But for as incredible as Batman 89 is, Batman Returns upped the game on pretty much every front. Michael Keaton did an incredible job playing the quasi-aloof mile-a-minute Bruce Wayne who could switch on a dime, and with a quick costume change, into the cool, unyielding Batman. But he's even better in Returns as a more dour Bruce one who suffers no fools and who shifts into Batman just as effortlessly but with an added streak of ruthlessness. Vicky Vale was a well-developed and wholly convincing romance for Bruce Wayne, but Selina Kyle adds a sinister, mysterious undertone to the romance that is fascinating and, with its bittersweet conclusion, ultimately more compelling. Returns gets accused of being more of a Tim Burton film than a Batman film, and I get it, but I also disagree for the most part. I think that by being given greater creative control, by leaning into his style more, Burton actually enriches the Gotham of his earlier movie, fully fleshes out the city as a living, breathing, cinematic world, and all the finer details, Batman, Alfred, the villains, Catwoman, not only mesh together just a little bit better than the elements of Batman 89 do, we actually get the live-action Batman film that arguably feels the closest to a traditional Batman story, even if it takes creative liberties with the visuals, aka a damn good adaptation. The first and most vital thing that helps Batman Returns achieve this is the setting. Like I said, Gotham feels like a complete living city here. In the first film, you get the sense that they built a huge downtown area to set most of the film in, and then added locations for each of the few scenes that are set beyond its boundaries. Batman Returns, on the other hand, still has that sprawling downtown, that intimidating core of the city that looks like the world's hub of grime and crime, but it also has areas like 
the town square where Max Shrek makes his speech at the start of the film, the sewer network where Penguin lives, the rows of shops, the added sets of alleyways and streets that make set pieces like the car chase feel way bigger. Now, obviously you can't just build an entire literal city, otherwise the film you're making would probably cost a billion dollars. So Burton and the production team use miniatures and matte paintings in order to further flesh out Gotham and make each area feel like it flows into the others featured in the movie. Again, it's not that Batman 89 didn't do this, it's just when comparing the look of the two films, you can clearly see 89 was hindered by first film budgetary constraints, whereas Batman Returns had the freedom and financial success to take it a step further. To this day, I still feel like this is the best Gotham City, excluded the undisputed champ, Batman Begins of course, we've gotten in live action. The Gotham of the Schumacher films feels like an unending series of mazes defined by skyscrapers and gothic statues, and those Nolan films, for as much as I love them and I love the Gotham City that comes with them, does kind of feel more like New York City or Chicago rather than its own place. A cinematic world only works if it both captivates and immerses us, and Batman Returns' central city is a resounding success. It gives us the perfect combination of a style that is unique to Batman, the added personal touch of Tim Burton, and the illusion that this is a real place with real people. It should be the template moving forward for how Gotham should look. Thankfully, Matt Reeves seems to have understood the assignment if the trailers for the Batman are anything to go by. And it only gets better once you cover it in snow. It is, after all, the holiday season, snowy season, folks, and with it comes the unavoidable debate about whether or not certain movies are Christmas movies. And before you jump in the comments and proclaim that Die Hard is a Christmas movie and you won't hear an argument to the contrary, know that I am with you. I really am, but right now, Die Hard needs to take a backseat because the Christmas movie that gets the most overlooked at Christmas is, well, Batman Returns. Why? Well, the thing that makes Batman Returns unquestionably a Christmas movie is kind of the fact that it's an anti-Christmas movie. You're definitely not in for an elf or a Christmas story or it's a wonderful life type of tale about someone figuring themselves out during the holidays. Instead, Batman Returns is more about the melancholy of Christmas. I mean, we all love the holidays, the presents, the family get-togethers, but there's also a certain sadness attached to this time of year. Christmas kind of becomes less of this special year capping event as we get older, as we have each successive year celebration and instead turns into, well, another holiday with a bit more pomp and circumstance. I think that probably applies to a lot of the things we loved as kids, but Christmas is such a high watermark of our youth that it makes the drop off that much steeper. We think more about how we're older, how we're getting older, about the people we used to celebrate this thing with that are no longer here to celebrate it with us, about how it's like the Sunday of the year. It's a great bit of respite, but Monday is also right around the corner. A new year is right around the corner. The grind is just about to begin again. It becomes bittersweet, and you feel that in Batman Returns. I mean, how many movies really focus on that part of Christmas? Sure, there are movies where the main character might be feeling that melancholy and the story might involve them overcoming it, but how many Christmas movies stay in that feeling? Let's look at Batman. Bruce Wayne is a man down on himself for the holidays. His relationship with Vicki Vale has ended, and all that he feels he is left with is the suit. He has so deeply infused himself with being Batman, with combating crime in Gotham, that he loses sight of his real life. He's much more distant from Alfred in this movie much colder and even has more of a ruthless streak going for him, such as when he takes out the fire breather with the Batmobile's exhaust flames, or when he smacks Catwoman off the roof of that building. Granted, that was partly in self-defense and he does reach to stop her from falling, but it's still a sudden and impulsive act of violence that we don't really see from any other interpretation of Batman outside of, you know, 
Even the very end of the film shows Bruce caught in this melancholy from his belief that he has lost Selina to finding and adopting her cat, a heartwarming moment that has a tinge of sadness to it as the cat is his reminder of her, to Alfred and Bruce exchanging Christmas wishes as the clock passes midnight. Alfred fully embraces and expresses the cheer of the holiday, but Bruce's reciprocation falls short of containing the same joy. After all, he's lost a potential partner just as quickly as he thought he had found her, after what is apparently the first time he has opened up to someone romantically since Vicky left. While it's promising that Bruce should take that chance with Selena, and while her survival, even if Bruce is unaware of it, leaves open the possibility that they could one day rekindle their romance, it's possible that Bruce will end up even more distant after the ending of Batman Returns than he was at the beginning of it. Selena, similarly, isn't having a good Christmas. She feels like a bumbling disappointment at work, her boyfriend has broken it off, and worst of all, right as she ups her workload and tries to impress Max Shrek, he responds by attempting to murder her because she discovered his plans in the process. If she hadn't been revived by the very creatures she loves the most, that would have been it for her, an ignoble end to an ignoble city during the holidays. The fate she receives by being revived could be perceived as just as bad. The experience turns her into a villain of her own, so consumed by a need for revenge against Shrek that she blows up an entire department store teams up with the Penguin, even assists in framing Batman at the cost of the life of the Ice Princess, and she shows little, if any, remorse for her actions. Even her final revenge against Shrek comes at a grave cost. To me, it represents the death of Selina Kyle, the moment where she fully becomes Catwoman, and the alter ego of her real person all but ceases to exist. To that end, when we do find out Catwoman has survived in the final shot, we only see her from behind, a faceless entity in the cat suit, because the suit might as well be all that is left. Finally, Oswald Cobblepot seems at first to be heading on the same kind of journey that has come to define Christmas movies, a search for answers about who he is, a search for his family. Of course, we see him commit villainous acts right from the get-go, whether it be murdering the family cat as a baby or disrupting Max Shrek's speech and causing mayhem as a grown man, but set that aside, the film still depicts his search for a family right up to the moment he finds them, after his parents have already died. It's like a twisted mirror of the first act of countless Christmas movies, but for the sake of argument, let's compare it to Elf. The rest of Batman Returns is like if Buddy found out Walter Hobbs had died before they could meet, and then went on to terrorize New York City. Really, Tim Burton seems to generally have a thing for the melancholy of Christmas. It's obviously all over The Nightmare Before Christmas, the moment where everything falls apart in Edward Scissorhands happens at Christmas, and Batman Returns is basically about how these three characters all have a really bad holiday season. Like I said, it's the anti-Christmas movie which is exactly why it deserves to be more in the conversation about the films that are Christmas movies, whether you want them to be or not. What also makes Batman Returns great, though, is how it's simultaneously a heavy political film. You guys know how I love my socio-political commentaries in my films. I mean, to an extent, every Batman film is this, but Batman Returns is probably my favorite iteration of this. All Batman films make a pretty solid point of how broken Gotham is, but Returns really points the finger at people like Bruce Wayne or Max Shrek. It really makes a point of criticizing how they could have used their wealth and power to solve the city's problems. In Shrek's case, he's just a corporate greedy son of a bitch. But Bruce, and maybe this is down to his depression post Vicky, combined with his deeper inhabitation of Batman, but he could be doing more. Take that boardroom meeting between him and Max. Yeah, well. I'm gonna fight you on this. He says about the power plant that is clearly designed to hoard power from the city. You're gonna fight Max, Bruce? Why haven't you already been using your non-Batman powers to do just that? Wake up, Batman! Which, to be fair, Batman does end up doing, after all. Part of the problem is that Bruce has more or less committed to this idea that he has to fight people like Shrek as Batman, and so he doesn't put his best foot forward until he's inside the suit. But maybe Bruce could have done more without relying on his alter ego if he had acted against Shrek sooner, or if he was using Batman as a last resort rather than his first option. It's perhaps the tragedy of Batman 
Bruce Wayne has overused that power to the point where he and Gotham at large now requires a regular dosage of it in order for goodness to remain afloat. It's a negative feedback loop in a way of an initial miscalculation that has now made evil too powerful in Gotham for Bruce Wayne alone to fight. And speaking of people who could be doing more to fight the evil of Max Shrek, let's talk about how much the mayor of Gotham sucks. The mayor just cares about his image. There's no compromise with him. He just wants to look good and get re-elected. And after all of that, all of his machinations, he's just a pawn for Shrek anyway. The second Shrek realizes that this mayor is only going to be a nuisance to his plans, he schemes to replace him with Oswald. The people of Gotham end up having to choose between two con men, and while Oswald is the worst choice by far, the people of Gotham really deserve better than either of these two people. And if that isn't the story of politics at large, I really don't know what is. Even more so, the way that Oswald's entire campaign is predicated on the sympathy and pity of his story feels true to life. It's easy to garner votes if you have a good story and if you can make the people empathize with you. And if you can make the people empathize with you, you're going to have a sizable portion of them eating out of your hand. Oswald, despite being naive and desperate for his wishes to be granted, gets conned into embracing that reality because Shrek pushes it onto him and, in turn, the people, being desperate for change, embrace Oswald. However, it's only once Shrek screws Oswald over that the latter is truly liberated. It's only once all of the ugliness rises to the surface that Oswald is closest to achieving what he wants, and that feels eerily true in hindsight with the culture we currently live in, where gross, insane people get rewarded by winning elections only once they really let the batshit craziness fly. It's actually funny that they cast Danny DeVito as the Penguin, because I think a lot of that is present in It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, where everyone kind of sucks, and no scheme is below them if it means getting a step ahead. Maybe that's part of why some people find Batman Returns so off-putting, because the film has an undercurrent of ugliness to it. And Alfred might honestly be the only individual person who is entirely wholesome, who doesn't contribute in any way whatsoever to perpetuating that ugliness. And no, I'm not saying that means Bruce Wayne is on the same level as Shrek, or the mayor, or Oswald. I'm not saying that Batman is a villain in his own film. I'm saying that the darkness and ugliness has gotten its hooks in Bruce Wayne, and to that end, Batman is less popular amongst the citizens of Gotham in Batman Returns than he is in arguably any other Batman film. That being said, the seedy political undertones at play justify why Gotham needs Batman. While Bruce Wayne could do more with his resources to help, he is ultimately doing the most good as Batman. He needs to be Batman. Gotham is this weird animal kingdom. Batman isn't outside it or above it, and if he wants to do good, he has to get in line with the natural order. He has to go down to Gotham's level. In a way, Batman becomes and is a monster as well, the same way that Oswald and Selina became monsters, but only in the sense that he was morphed into something by his circumstances. He's not evil and doesn't commit evil acts. That complexity is part of the brilliance of Tim Burton's work. People play roles, they put on masks, literally in some of his films, metaphorically in others, whether they conform with social or societal standards or not. To Burton, he sees conformity as a pitfall of apathy, something that causes society to atrophy. But at the same time, going too far in fighting that conformity causes chaos. It's like a feeling of anti-suburbia that you can similarly find in Frankenweenie and Edward Scissorhands. And think about that. We don't see any suburbs in Gotham, and it's falling apart at the seams. It's a showcase of that latter extreme, where conformity doesn't seem to exist at all, and things are reduced to a listless chaos, with Batman having to try and hold everything together the best he can. This idea that the people who are running the city of Gotham are normal, everyday people. Burton always criticizes and sees the ugliness of the mundane, of the ordinary. He's an outsider who is chastised for being different, yet his difference is ultimately what lends to the betterment of whatever is going on. It lends to good things happening. Burton does this in all of his films, but because he thinks so differently, and because he's such an outsider, he is able to see the status 
quo for what it is to see evil not have to wear a mask. And so basically, in Batman Returns, all of these characters, in order to shake up the evil that's going on, in order to make a difference or feel liberated, they become outsiders. They put on this mask, these ridiculous outfits. There's this whole idea of power and dominance. And for so long, they tried to conform to the societal norm. Penguin, when he's running for office, tries to do that as a normal person. Selena Kyle tries to be a good secretary and just woman in the workplace. And Bruce, of course, is kind of in this weird limbo of, you know, wanting a normal life, but also like feeling like that's not the real him and this Batman thing looming over him, this curse. Throughout the course of Batman Returns, all of these characters are liberated in a sense and they become the dominant person. Additionally, Burton's work often emphasizes that bad people are everywhere. It's not in a nihilistic way. Good often has at least an emotional, if not literal, victory over evil in his films, but it is widely prevalent. And even within the evil itself, there's always a certain amount of sympathy to be gleaned. Selina, for example, does some really awful things after becoming Catwoman, and her being a victim doesn't negate how bad those things are, but you can at least understand why she does those things, and there are certain moments in the film where you almost want to root for her. For example, is it really such a bad thing that she wants Max Shrek dead? Is Gotham not arguably a better place with him gone? Even Penguin who is much more of an evil person than Selina, can still be pitied because of his having been born deformed and abandoned by his parents, both things that he had absolutely no control over. By the end of his story, he's more pathetic than he is fearsome, and maybe that's even the case throughout the entirety of his villainous run. The nature of Gotham adds another layer of complexity to this. Just because we can pinpoint the good and bad qualities of people doesn't mean the city itself agrees. Oswald's parents are snobby, awful people who literally threw their own child away for the sake of their own social standing, but they never get punished for that. They get to live out the rest of their lives in relative peace and prosperity. The Waynes, on the other hand, are good and virtuous people who are rewarded for it by being murdered in front of their son in an alleyway. Batman Returns intertwines all of this into its narrative. And whether the movie works for you or you find it too cynical as a result, I don't think you can deny how fascinating and ambitious it is. The cherry on top of all of this, or the star on top of the Christmas tree, if we want to go with the holiday allegory, is the terrific ending. For all of his introvertedness and ruthlessness in the film, Bruce Wayne ultimately finds his humanity in his attempts to save Selina from completing the cycle of revenge, from going down the path of fully embracing her dark side. He tries so hard to make everything right, but it's too late, and Max Shrek literally knocks him into reality with a bullet once his guard is down. In essence, the fates of Bruce, Selina, and Max were all sealed by Bruce's moment of compassion. Bruce is incapacitated, Max is killed, and Selina, though she physically survives, loses herself. And Bruce loses her as well. Bruce tries his best to accept this and move on, but it's pretty clear from that final moment in the backseat of the car that the events of the film aren't sitting well with him. And though that very final shot does rise up to reveal that Catwoman is still alive, it does so at the same time that the bat signal flares up, a reminder that Gotham will always be broken, will always need Batman, and an affirmation that Selina Kyle is no more that Catwoman has taken over and that the systems and society that made their stories happen will never go away. And who knows, maybe Bruce Wayne could have found a way to solve his problem in the next movie, but we never got it. If Batman 89 was Tim Burton playing it safe, then Batman Returns is him unleashed as a filmmaker. I think that holds true. He got virtually unlimited control over this movie thanks to the success of Batman 89 and Edward Scissorhands, and that freedom comes through on screen in every moment. I love Batman Returns. I love the way Burton unashamedly went full tilt into this. I love the way that his style and vision are 
always in your face. And yet, I still feel like I'm inside the world of Batman watching it. It isn't him literally adapting from the comics, but you get a Gotham that aesthetically feels like the comics. A Batman that feels like the character of the page, and a story that is unafraid to show how dark and messed up a city like Gotham would actually need to be in order to need someone like Batman. Burton committed to that fearlessly, in a way that no other directed could, happy meals be damned. He as a creative person was able to bring something iconic to Batman, and captured the same feeling, the ambiance of the comics, without compromising his own desires as a filmmaker. That's a monumental achievement. So many adaptations, regardless of what they're adapting, get so caught up in replicating the look and aesthetic instead of adding something valuable to the canon. Something artistic that still channels the very essence of the original work, but which also blesses us with something new. With Batman Returns, Tim Burton created something that made Batman better. Again, the clear influence on those 90s Batman cartoons is undeniable, and I don't think there's a single Batman fan in existence who dislikes those cartoons. In fact, I'm pretty sure those Batman cartoons are what a lot of fans consider to be the best Batman anything that's ever been produced. They're the thing I see get more praise online than any other film or piece of media, and they remain universally beloved even by people who aren't Batman enthusiasts. It kind of confounds me then why Batman Returns didn't work for people, but maybe it's part of that old adage of how the first guy through the wall is always the one who ends up bleeding the most. Maybe Batman Returns needed to be the test run for everything that came after, and as a result, it didn't catch on at the time and has had a slower climb to the top. I mean, even something like Batman Begins probably owes this film something. Imagine if the Burton and Schumacher films had never existed, and in 2005, Nolan came out of nowhere with Batman Begins. I don't know if the world would have been ready. Either way, I think people expected more of the usual with Batman Returns, and not a film that upped the ante by way of creative risk-taking. And instead, Tim Burton pushed the envelope further on what he started with Batman 89. As a result, we got one of the most brilliant Batman films ever made, a weightier adventure centered on three tortured souls who came to shake up Christmas and liberate themselves from the shackles of tradition, or the norm, in the process. So go ahead this holiday season and add Batman Returns in between your Christmas carols and Miracle on 34th Street. Not only are you in for a true holiday classic, you're in for one of of the definitive Batman adventures. And hey, if you haven't been that big of a fan of the film in the past, maybe this time through, Batman Returns will end up being like mistletoe to you. You know, minus the whole killing and dying thing.